Hello everyone and welcome back to Mossy Bottom. No, I haven't moved house, but you might want to because this video marks the beginning in a new series here on my channel in which I get to explore Ireland, a country which I adore and now call home, discovering dream cottages which I think have the potential to become self-sufficient small holdings. And that means, one, they have at least an acre of land for vegetable beds, orchards, forest gardens, and maybe even grain production. And of course, for keeping animals uh, such as chickens, ducks, pigs like me, goats, or even horses and cattle if there's enough. Two, they're for sale right now at the time of filming. Although I must say I have no affiliation whatsoever with the seller and make no commission from any potential sale. This is my own view and interpretation of the property, both the good and the bad, not a commercial. And three, they have that little something extra, that magic that we're all looking for. With my cottage here in County Sligo, it was the isolation at the end of a kilometre long lane that I fell in love with. Not many cottages in that price range have that. And I looked at about a dozen. But equally, that magical quality, it could be the house or the outbuildings, perhaps it's a converted church or school. It could be the location uh, near a lake or a beach or in a hidden valley. It could be the aspect, perhaps the view is just to die for. Um, or maybe the land is what sells it. Do you get your own enchanted forest or mountain top? You wouldn't grow much food up there, I'm afraid, but it could be great for a wind turbine. The good life does not have to be a dream. With enough hard work, self-belief, and the right property to turn into a small holding or homestead, it can be a reality. That's exactly what I did right here five years ago. And the journey, which I'm still on, has transformed my life for the better. You'll find dozens of other videos on this channel about my life here in the west of Ireland, keeping animals, growing food, and all my creative projects. But this series is all about going on an adventure and discovering what else is out there. Even if you don't share that dream, you might just enjoy exploring this beautiful land with me. Finally, I'm going to try and use the experience that I now have after five years living here on my small holding to critically assess how suitable a property would be for self-sufficiency. We'll look at size and quality of land, the condition of the house and the outbuildings, and the work, time and skills needed to restore or convert them, the location, access to towns and nature, potential resources like hydro, wind, solar or even grants, and of course the associated costs. I'm going to look at each property as if I was considering moving there myself and that's what makes it so much fun for me. And in conclusion I'm going to talk about who I think it would suit, a family, a couple, uh, someone looking for full or maybe just partial self-sufficiency, working from home part-time or trying to turn the land and buildings into a business. I'm going to give it the full top to mossy bottom tour and I cannot tell you how excited I am because this first cottage, as you've already seen in that snippet, is an absolute gem. So let's get started. So this property is located in County Leitrim, not far from me. And Leitrim, I think, is a largely undiscovered wonderland. Every time I drive through, it reminds me of the highlands of Scotland. It's more mountainous than Sligo, where I live, with forests and lakes everywhere. It's also more sheltered, being more inland. Um, and that's an important consideration if you want to grow food outside. It does mean a degree or two colder in the winter, though. Although the cottage is tucked away in the countryside near the town of Mohill, the nearest large town is Carrick-on-Shannon, which is a really lovely place to spend a day, as well as having every major supermarket and type of shop you could ever need. And if you've ever dreamt of touring the Irish waterways by boat, then Carrick, situated as it is on the Shannon River, is probably the best place in the whole country to do it from. Okay, this was the drive-in, and take a look at that sign. I love how it's described as interesting property. I'm not sure you'd find that written on for sale signs in the UK. From this point on, everything you see 
is yours. It's a long driveway bordered by rhododendron bushes and mature broadleaf trees. And just look what it gives way to. Isn't that something? This was the former home of a largely self-sufficient family living here up until the early 1970s. They produced beef, chicken, turkey to sell at Christmas, eggs, their own dairy products like milk and butter, and of course, vegetables are plenty. Some of it they sold, but much was for their own consumption and survival. They would also fish and hunt wild rabbit and deer to supplement their diet. And I've also learned one of the staples of their diet was a thing called box tea, a type of potato bread cooked on an open hearth, which I have to say, I'm now very keen to try myself. I've just harvested my potatoes, so this is the perfect time. So what do you get and how much is it? Well, you get two buildings. The property on the left is actually the former residence, though it's been somewhat reclaimed by nature, as you will see. And the second, on the right, is a former stone outbuilding or shed, which has since been partially converted into a cottage by the current owner, who's a carpenter by trade. Both do need work, as you will see. You also get 15 acres of agricultural land, currently used to produce silage. And a further, and this is the really special part, 15 acres of forestry, most of which is planted with broadleaf trees like beech, birch and oak. It's eight years old, so not yet mature, but large enough mostly to walk through. In total, over 31 acres of land. Furthermore, the property adjoins a large lake with wild perch, pike, eel and other native fish, which you could certainly moor a boat on. We're going to explore everything in more detail, and not just from the ground, but by air too, and that's even more exciting. First though, the price. 180,000 euros, which to put it in perspective, is less than the average price of a two bedroom terrace in the UK. Is there a catch, I hear you ask? Well, it depends on your perspective. There's definitely a catch working with this dog. There are always compromises. So let's dig a little deeper. First, the former residence. And this little three room cottage reminds me so much of my own. It's only slightly smaller than mine, but has many of the same features, which you will find um, also on thousands of cottages uh, from this period. It's about a hundred years old, I would say, here in Ireland. They're largely abandoned now because I suppose, understandably, Irish people don't really want to live in them anymore, being so small, poorly or not at all insulated and uh, prone to damp. The walls of this cottage are part stone and part rubble with a concrete skin which I suspect was added later. The roof is slated um, but in clear need of replacement. I suspect all the timber work in there is rotten. The windows are wooden um, and in much better condition than my own. I think these have been added uh, more recently. There's no concrete base or insulation anywhere in this cottage. The main room has a large central chimney breast, the hearth of the home, and the back room has a smaller cast iron fireplace built in cupboard as well, <laughs> just what you need. Um, and being built against the bank of a hill, it's already been partially invaded by ivy vines. Next will come the brambles, and in a decade or two, you might even find a birch tree, uh, which is a pioneer species, growing in the earth floor, right in the middle of this building. So this house clearly isn't fit for habitation. It's not as structurally sound as my own cottage, leaving you, I think, with two options. The first is to knock it down and use the footprint to build something else, like a workshop, or housing for animals, or even a new house. The second, which I think is what I'd do, is repair the damage to the roof and walls and then keep it as a storage space, which is always very handy on a small holding. I think if you attempted a full restoration, you'd probably find with the rubble walls that rebuilding it from scratch might be unavoidable. So preservation for its historical value, uh, which wouldn't cost much, probably would be my choice. 
next the real fairy tale cottage, which, as I mentioned, is currently listed as an outbuilding. So if you wanted to live in this, and I certainly would, you would have to apply for retention to the planners, and that would incur a fee. The first catch? Well, maybe, but it's definitely reflected in that price. And I personally wouldn't be too intimidated by doing that. After all, the original house is a registered dwelling mere metres away from the cottage conversion. And that conversion is, from what I can see, done to a fairly high standard. So what I'd do is have a local architect or surveyor assess the cottage um, and hopefully confirm that it would pass planning regulations. If they produced a list of changes that would first need to be made, I'd price them out, or if I was unsure of anything, I'd ask a local builder to do that for me. I think from the research that I've done that the saving in that asking price would be far greater than the cost, both bureaucratic and practical, of turning this into a home. So, what needs doing? Well, as you can see, it has first fit electrics, plumbing for a ground floor and first floor bathroom, insulation in the floor and walls. I saw no signs of damp or ventilation issues throughout. There's also no visible cracks or evidence of subsidence in the structure. It's been drywalled, but it needs plastering. It needs a staircase, of which there are definitely building regulations which you'd have to adhere to. You might also have to replace uh, one or possibly both of those stable doors with a conventional house door. The chimney would have to be checked and certified, and I'd have a professional install a wood-burning stove. As you've got limitless um, supply of hardwood timber growing on site uh, to burn and heat the house with. The windows are fairly new and in great condition. They are plastic though. Personally, I love making windows so I'd replace them like for like with wooden ones which I'd make myself. But it certainly isn't necessary. They are in good condition. Upstairs, there are large V-Lux style windows which let in much more light. There are two double bedrooms, which admittedly aren't the biggest. They are doubles, but they're a tight squeeze. But what you lose in space, you more than get back in charm and views. Because from every window of this cottage, everything you see is yours. This house isn't going to suit a large family. But for an individual, or a couple, or even a small family, content to spend most of their time working on and enjoying the 31 acres of land, I don't think you need anything bigger. It'll be cheap, or indeed free, to heat from your own timber supply. There's electricity on site, with a connection on your own land. I was told it hasn't been live for about 30 years, but hey, the fact it's there means you wouldn't have to pay for a new connection. There's also a mains water supply um, on site right next to the houses, which is something I don't have here at Mossy Bottom. What a luxury that is. Clean, safe water on tap. You would, of course, have to plumb it to the cottage and, of course, have a certified electrician hook up your electric supply and sign all the appropriate paperwork. All these things will cost money, but I think if you're handy and willing to do a lot of the building work yourself, none of which is structural, then you can really keep the renovation costs down at this property. And even if you employ tradesmen and women to do all of that for you, um, there really isn't that much to do. Though I should caution you, I do say that as someone who bought a ruin. Next, the really fun bit, exploring those 31 acres. First of all, the only other outbuilding on site, which, you've guessed it, is the old privy. There's still water in there. Not quite sure where it's coming from. I guess maybe it's plumbed in. You're definitely not gonna get a more private bathroom than this probably not another human being for miles around. There is incidentally a septic tank here too, but it would I'm quite sure need replacing if you did want to have flushing toilets. Personally I much prefer my composting toilet, which unlike an expensive septic tank and there are many thousands these days, cost me nothing. 
and after two years in the company of bacteria and worms gives me a lovely crumbly compost to enrich my soil with. It's free, it's good for nature, it's good for your bank balance and it doesn't waste fresh water. So access to the forestry is up a fairly steep trail behind those buildings which was formerly the only access to the cottage. Imagine hiking up and down this with your shopping. The former occupant lived into her 90s apparently and I can see why. She must have been one fit lady. Once you reach a higher elevation the views are quite spectacular. They really open up especially of that lake which your land adjoins remember. And this is the type of forestry which you can really get lost in. As you can see it is mature enough for the most part uh, to walk through but if it was mine I'd carve a nature trail right the way through it and gravel it or perhaps wood chip it to keep those weeds at bay. It would be a fair bit of work to do that and to maintain but worth it I think. And as those trees mature the ground cover and the bush will be overtaken for light. Another option um, which I'd be tempted to do I have to say is fence the perimeter really well and then introduce a drove of pigs. And pigs are forest animals um, and would keep the brambles and other weeds down while not significantly harming the trees. And with 15 acres of broadleaf forestry there's an awful lot of space so if you wanted to create a truly organic pig farm you're probably not going to find anywhere better to do it. You could also clear areas to create more high pasture for grazing um, be it for sheep or even for horses or cattle. Goats could also be an option in here but um, they would probably I suspect damage a lot of those young hardwood saplings. Goats do like to munch on the leaves of trees and even the branches. There is I'm told a grant on this forestry which pays around 3,000 euros a year. There was some question over whether um, you'd need to be a registered farmer to claim that money. It may be that you'd receive a reduced amount if you weren't. Um, that's something that you'd need to research yourself if you wanted to avail of it. Though you would of course uh, in that scenario have to leave the trees untouched. Still a potential and quite significant income source for doing nothing at all. One of the great things about broadleaf woodland is it's such a good habitat for mushrooms, different species of fungi. Um, if you're an avid forager uh, this would be a wonderful woodland to forage in I think. The other thing to consider is the long-term value of that hardwood timber. While you're enjoying having a private forest with all its many uses and benefits those trees are of course growing year on year and creating an asset which hopefully you won't then cut down and sell. I know I wouldn't um, because one of my dreams is to reinstate a broadleaf forest around my small holding here. But its increased maturity will absolutely add to the value of the property. It's eight years old right now. Just imagine how it would look in another 10 or 20. And what a privilege watching it grow and discovering all the species of insect, bird and mammal which make it their home. I know there are deer roaming through this forest. I also saw fox scat on the trail which means there must be abundant prey for them too. What better place potentially to turn into a biodiverse wildlife sanctuary. There are so many other options here too. Um, one being to use the hardwood timber to make things with. If you're interested in wood turning or cabinet making what an opportunity having 15 acres of oak, beech and other broadleaf trees would represent. And now let's head back to the cottage and explore the 15 acres of pasture which is all located along either side of the drive as you approach the buildings. And this potentially is where catch number two comes in. There are quite a few rushes in this ground which means it's very wet and it is quite low but the owner tells me it's good rich soil which I can well believe. Very peaty soil, very dark, very fertile. Um, you will have to put up with it being quite wet though. 
I think it's currently used to make silage. In terms of livestock, I think this would make excellent grazing land in the warmer months, particularly for lighter animals like sheep or goats. Cows and horses are liable to compact the already quite wet soil, which could exacerbate flooding in the winter. Rushes, which are inedible to most livestock, tend to grow in the imprints left by the hooves um, of heavy animals, which then fill with rainwater, especially in heavy clay-rich soil like this. So, in other words, the more you graze, especially with those heavier animals, the more rushes you get, the less grass and less usable the land becomes. Because this whole lowland area is a potential floodplain, I would only graze it lightly in the summer, perhaps keeping the bulk of that 15 acres as a source of hay or silage for winter feed. That way, if you wanted to keep cows or horses, you could bring them in over the winter or keep them on the higher ground behind the buildings. In terms of horses, you could create your very own bridleway through that forest, which is all high ground, so it wouldn't flood. And what better place for walking them than through your very own 15 acres of broadleaf forest? Not to mention, they'd never be short of winter feed if you did it that way. You could also experiment with growing barley or even oats, which I think is more tolerant of wet soil, and definitely thrives here in Ireland. An acre or two of oats every year would go a long way towards self-sufficiency, both for you and your livestock. The further down that path you go, though, the more equipment you need um, to process it. But with this amount of land, true self-sufficiency is technically possible, I think. Heck, you could even, in theory, grow wheat here. It's not the perfect climate, of course, or even the perfect part of Ireland, but you would, I think, get a crop. Maybe you could also build a windmill to make your own flour. There's no limit, is there? From my perspective, one of the great things about this land is the perimeter of mature and semi-mature trees which surround it. As a vegetable grower, and you can see my veggies behind me here, um, I know just how limiting those strong Atlantic winds can be to your crop. All it takes is one heavy storm in the growing season and they're all blown over. So having an established windbreak like that is a big advantage if you want to grow outdoor vegetables. And I think this truly would be an excellent place for an organic vegetable farm, especially with that rich peaty soil. So let's talk about those fundamentals of life, food, water, warmth, and shelter, which those of you who've watched my other videos will have heard me mention so many times. And just for fun, let's give this cottage and its land a little self-sufficiency score for each. First of all, food. Well, you've got 15 acres of agricultural land here. That's summer and winter feed for many livestock, and potentially for you and your family through vegetables and other crops. You also have a lake full of fish, which you have direct access to on your own land. It doesn't get much better than that. I'm gonna to have to give it five out of five for food. Water. Well, you've got mains water, it's already connected. And if you want or need more, you could always create a gravity-fed uh, rainwater collector on top of that hill, which could give you an alternative supply, though it's really not necessary. You've also got the lake. It's got to be five out of five again for water. Warmth. Well, you've got 15 acres of broadleaf forestry that's a lot of nights tucked up by a cosy wood-burning stove in that cottage. You might want to invest in a wood splitter or a few volunteers at least every year to collect it for you because it is a lot of hard work. The only thing better than that forest would be a geothermal vent, but come on guys, it's got to be a five again. Shelter? Well, you have a beautiful cottage, though you can't quite live in it yet, and a tumble-down one which you can, but probably wouldn't want to. That means, in the short term at least, you might want to put up a caravan or mobile home on site. My advice, don't move into the cottage while doing the renovation, however tempting, because it'll make life so much harder. You're also lacking additional outbuildings, like a granary for food storage, stables for your goats, pigs, sheep, horses, etc. And a workshop for all those projects that no doubt you will have. 
so you should definitely allow funds and time to build them in the years to come. Um, although the cottage is one of the most beautiful I've seen, particularly the location, um, on the self-sufficiency rating it gets a 3 out of 5. I'm also going to add two more categories, access, essential when living in a remote location like this, and income. In other words, opportunities to make enough money from the property to pay for the things which you can't self-produce. For access, there is a huge concern, and that's that your drive passes right through that floodplain. For most of the year, it's not going to be an issue, but in the winter, it could well flood for days or even weeks on end. One solution would be to turn the forest track into a road, connecting on the west side of the property. Um, but that's an expensive undertaking. I know the current owner was quoted 15,000 euros to do that professionally. Another option is to raise the level of the current drive, which is much shorter in length. But that is a big job too. Um, but if you hired a digger and bought the stone, you could potentially do it yourself. It's something that you might want to do for peace of mind, unless, of course, you're comfortable um, with the idea of being trapped here during the winter months. It's not like you'd starve or freeze to death. In fact, it'd probably be a lovely feeling knowing you can provide for yourself. Still, I'm going to have to give access a 2 out of 5 because of those problems. Finally, income. Well, with that forest, the grant, the timber, the potential for livestock, the 15 acres of fertile pasture for growing food, which you could then sell, not to mention the outrageous beauty of this place, it would make a wonderful getaway or an Airbnb site if you added more buildings. There are lots of options here. There's nothing ready made though, so whatever you pursue would require work and potentially investment. But it really is a blank canvas. I'm going to give it 4 out of 5 for income. So who would this dream cottage and land suit? Well, someone with energy. It's got the potential to be everything you could ever dream of but it will require work and passion. It's not a place, I don't think, to retire to. It's a place to wake up in. A young couple or a small family with enough money left over to finish the cottage, um, buy the equipment they need to get started, and maybe even build one or two outbuildings. And of course, the motivation to learn all the many skills they'll need um, in order to make this life a success. Animal husbandry, carpentry, farming, forestry management, fishing, you name it, this property will make use of every bit of learning you're willing to do. Finally, if I bought this property, what would I do? Well, this is the really fun bit. I think I'd turn that forestry into an organic pig farm, allowing the trees to grow. I'd then build myself um, a workshop making handmade furniture, selling what I made to generate a small income, as it's something I already know how to do. I'd certainly grow all the vegetables I'd need, and I'd also turn part of the forest into a fruit orchard for limitless apple crumbles and strawberry wine, sheltered as it would be by all the other trees. I'd build a raised wooden walkway and pontoon to that lake, and I'd make myself a traditional Irish curragh on which I'd sit for hours, sipping wine, waiting for those eels to bite. I'd put a wind turbine on top of that hill and install chest freezers aplenty to store all my produce. And then in the winter, I'd happily get cut off, spending the days making things and the nights writing stories by the fire. And you folks would probably never hear from me again because, alas, there'd be no time left over to make videos. Okay folks, that's just about it. I hope you've enjoyed this first episode in what I think will be a regular opportunity for me to explore Ireland. I can't wait to make the next in this series. Who knows where it'll take us. If you have a property which you think might be suitable, with at least an acre of land and a little touch of magic about it, whatever that may be, then get in touch. But remember, this isn't a commercial, so expect my true, unbiased opinions. And if you're interested in the dream cottage featured in this video, which at the time of filming, September 2021, really is for sale, then you'll find more information down in the description. 
Thank you as always for watching, subscribing and supporting the channel. And from me, wherever you are in the world, take care and bye for now. country which I adore and now call home. That fly landed right in my eye. Bugger. <laughs> <laughs>